Jim. Hey, I'm Jim Bianco. I'm the president and founder of Bianco Research, uh, located in Chicago, macro research firm that's affiliated with a bond brokerage firm called Arbor Research and Trading. So I tend to look at the market uh, from like a secular basis or a narrative basis. And what I've been arguing is that the pandemic has essentially taken trends that were in place and have sped them up. So, you know, I'm a big fan of sci-fi movies and I like time travel movies. So welcome to the year 2045. We got there really fast. And now the economy needs to kind of adjust to the whole movement of uh, the era of maybe cheap labor is is now being questioned. I thought Jim Chanos made a, a very good argument for that in the panel before. Um, cheap goods with the problems that we're having with China and in a just-in-time inventory world, that's going to be a very big problem. And cheap energy, especially for Europe, that is going to result in higher levels of inflation, more economic volatility. And I think what you've seen in markets this year is the adjustment towards that reality. And that adjustment towards that reality is going to continue for a while longer until everybody starts to change into that new reality. A good example of that is the one that we're all talking about today is liability driven investing out of the UK pensions. That was all predicated on the idea that we were in an era of low inflation, little volatility, very low rates. <clears throat> so that investment thesis made sense. We're not in that period anymore. And that's why it's having such a difficult time. And I think we're going to see more of that as we move forward. So you guys raised a, a bunch of things that I actually want to tackle, um, both cyclically where we are in the cycle, Mike, uh, and also this thing about the post-pandemic economy and structural inflation. And are we in a new paradigm now? Before we do that, I'm actually curious to ask all of you a question about investor frameworks. Because pre-2022, it seems that the dominant framework, at least you know, roughly speaking from Mario Draghi's speech in 2012 to 2022, was the Fed's got your back. The Fed's your, the Fed's your friend. If markets drop too far too fast, if there's too much blood in the water, the Fed can't stand the side of blood in the water. Mm -hmm. And it's going to come in and it's going to support the market. <coughs> it seems that, I think that was broadly a consensus view. It seems that in 2022, there is an emergent view that is gaining traction. I don't know how widely held it is, and I'm, that's one of the questions I'm curious about. But the view is roughly that the Fed actually, not only does it not particularly care about equity markets, but absent uh, a, a fall, a meaningful reduction, or a trend reduction in, in, in realized inflation, the Fed wants equity markets down. And whenever equity markets get, some, get a little bit of a pep in their step, the, you start seeing stories coming out of the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, et cetera, saying, you know, FOMC members aren't really happy about that. Somewhere in some boardroom somewhere, Jay Powell is steaming, contemplating, plotting his next rate hike. So is that, one, do you agree with that framing, that there's been a noticeable, meaningful shift? Uh, how widespread is it? And how credible is that uh, paradigm for thinking about Fed policy when higher rates mean higher cost of capital for the government, and in an economy that relies so much on debt refinancing, there's only so much in terms of balance sheet reduction that they can take. Let me start? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do agree that uh, there has been a paradigm shift from the Fed, that they are no longer your friend anymore. Or you know what? You could take all central banks. I mean, Barrio Draghi, whatever it takes in 2012. And what has changed is inflation. And what is what is really pushing them is this idea of inflation. Jay Powell has said it himself, 40% of the public has less than $1,000 of savings and they rent. They don't own financial assets, they don't own real estate. So when prices are outstripping their wage gains, they just lose. The rest of us, we're losing this year, but you know, Case Shiller was up 18% last year, the S&P was up 29% last year, and, for a while there, we all thought that inflation is not a bad thing because what we're seeing in, in our assets that we own is appreciating faster than the inflation rate. Well, that's all reversed uh, real quick. So what Paul has been pushing is this idea that the Fed needs to respond to inflation and needs to respond to inflation hard and aggressively. And the marketplace has had a very difficult time coming to grips with that. That's why we have this constant talk about a Fed pivot. And, if, uh, you know, and I've joked around that the Fed pivot is, please make my portfolio go up. 
that's really all it is at this point. Uh, it is nothing short of that. So I do think that that has been, yes, the Fed has, has definitely turned, and it is a very difficult thing for people to come to, come to grips with. Right, right. So, okay, but all right. So in, each, in all three of these cases, the, the concern was driven by financial markets, right? The Fed pivot was driven by financial market concerns. But in all three of those periods, something that they have in common is that inflation was either low or zero. it was... <laughs> Effectively zero. It was, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, or it was declining, today. right. Um, like it was in 87. So in all, in, all, in all of those cases, that we have the NYC bell. <laughs> the, um, so in all those cases, the, the Fed was not caught in this um, trap between trying to manage it, this unofficial mandate of financial stability and inflation. Now it is. And the question is, if something, quote, breaks, this is a con common concern. Um, we can talk about what that even means for something to break. But if something were to, quote, break, or if the, something in, in, the, in, the, in financial market plumbing would lead to um, a lot of volatility, et cetera, uh, and, and, and people would want the Fed to intervene to do something, how does the Fed manage that? What does that look like? What does a Fed pivot look like in such a scenario where inflation remains high? Can they do that and, and, and maintain the kind, that kind of credibility that I know Mike Green doesn't even think is relevant in this equation? Like, how do you guys think about that? Yeah, I'll go first. If, if, the, if there is going to be a pivot, I think it's going to be a scenario where the Fed's first reaction could be, OK, the inflation problem is now over. We've now broken the economy to the point where we've broken inflation. So we no longer have to deal with this inflation problem. So now we can pivot, to use their word, to dealing with a financial crisis problem. And then they could kind of dust off the 2008 or 2018 playbook and start running whatever chapters in that playbook they need to run at that point. But understand what I just said. You've got to break something to break inflation. British pensions are not breaking inflation. 25% down in the stock market is not breaking inflation. At least the Fed doesn't think that. So whatever it is, is going to be of such a uh, magnitude that when the Fed does pivot, it's not going to help if you're waiting for your portfolio to go up. Uh, I know that everybody wants it to be some exogenous event that has nothing to do with me, British pensions. And then the, therefore, the, now Jake can stop and the market can go up. Uh, but I do think it will have to be something where you could immediately say, now the inflation problem is behind us because we just broke the economy, which broke inflation. As to add to that, you know, um, the way I like to express it is the same thing here, is rising rates in and of themselves are neither bullish or bearish. It's why rates are rising. Now, if they're rising because, well, rising rates would usually correspond with more real nominal growth. Now, if it's the real part of growth that's driving them higher, that's a good thing. And the cyclicals go and everything else. If it is the inflation part that's driving them, it's not such a good thing. But it's been such a long time since we've seen inflation. I think a lot of people are having a hard time differentiating this because early on this year when rates started up, a common refrain I heard from everybody was, this is good for the cyclical stocks, right? Rising rates. And it's like, yeah, well, it depends on why rates are going up. And it's been 40 years since we've had to delineate the reason that rates were going up. It was almost always real growth. And that's what people have been struggling to get their head around. Sure. So, yeah, I was going to take what you said and, and go on the other side, too. When do rates peak? Yeah. And let me start with the two-year note. Um, if you look at the last six cycles, going back to the early 80s, and you look at what is known as the, term, uh, the terminal rate, where is the rate where the Fed stops raising rates. Um, every one of those cycles, and, and further, you look at, say, the Fed fund futures as some forward measure of where the market thinks the Fed's going to stop. The two-year rate usually goes above that rate. Uh, so to put that in today's terms, the expectations are that the Fed will stop at four and a half, and the terminal rate has gotten as high as four, the Fed fund futures has projected the terminal rate as high as 473. On average, you should go above 473 in the two-year note before this is over with, sometimes as much as a full percent. I mean, it doesn't have to be a full percent, but in every cycle, you will go above that rate. So we're at 430 on the two-year note right now. We've still got some ways to go if that historical analogy holds. On the long end of the curve, there's a, a problem here because 
The yield curve is inverted. The two-year, 10-year yield curve is inverted. So you're trading at about 35, 40 basis points lower yield on the 10-year than you are in the two-year. The most extreme it's been in the last 40 years has been minus 58. So we're not that far away from that. So unless you want to make the argument that the yield curve is going to go to minus 100, if the two-year note is going to keep going up, I think it's going to keep dragging the, two, the 10 year note higher as well, too, and that that relative curve uh, cycle will stay. So, as you said, this has been about a bear market in rate, a rising rates, a bear market in bonds. Um, when do we end this bear market in bonds? Well, when the, it's, the simple answer is when the Fed stops, but the more nuanced answer is probably above that terminal rate. And we've not hit that terminal rate, we've not seen those rates. Um, yet reach it. Uh, so we've got a ways to go if that historical example holds. So I want to try and combine um, two questions into one here. And uh, the, the first question is, do bonds at these prices represent a fairly good investment for a buy and hold investor? And the second question that kind of goes into that is, can the Fed, how, how high can the Fed really raise interest rates if that has such a negative long-term financing impact <clears throat> on the U.S. government. And so this brings up questions of stuff like yield curve control. In other words, are we, is it inevitable that the Fed is going to have to step into the breach to monetize government deficits long-term? Can I take the second part first? Yeah, take it. $30 trillion of de uh, debt outstanding, and net the government will refinance about one and a half of that a year. So, you know, in a year, 29 or $28.5 billion of the debt that they have has got a fixed rate, and that's not going to change. So if the, if the answer is, if rates go up, does that increase the interest rate cost to the government, and does that put a drag on the government's budget? Yes, in five years. Yes, maybe in three or four years. No, in the next year or two. And I think that that's motivating the Fed, too, that... They could take rates as high as they need to take them in late 22, 23, maybe in the early 24, and not have to worry about the refinancing implications of it. You start getting out 25, 26 with higher rates, then that becomes an issue. Their thinking is higher, more aggressive now into you know, 23, early 24, cut rates then after that, and then that this, this idea that we're going to have this interest cost balloon won't be as big a deal. Now, a lot of it will go into short-term debt, like you know, T-bill yields will go up, but then they'll come right back down when they, when they cut rates. So just very quickly, I'm sorry, because that, that doesn't match my understanding of what the, the average weighted duration of the U.S. federal deficit debt is. is it, isn't it more like seven years? It is, but you know, a lot of the debt is still less than one year. And so the assumption there is, yes, in the next year, everything that's a T-bill gets refinanced at a higher rate. Then they cut rates, and it all gets refinanced at a lower rate. But if you're talking about fixing rates at a permanently higher level that they have to pay for years on end, that, that's not, that, will, take a longer, that will take a longer time period to get the average, uh, the average interest rate um, much higher to, to see a drag on the uh, budget of, of the government. So there's two components to that that I guess I would push back on. One is interest on excess reserves, right? So we still have a fantastic amount of excess reserves that effectively have to receive the same level of interest expense right. as the Fed funds. You know, we're already at a loss on that now. The, 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 the Fed is paying out more, is already paying out more in interest on excess reserve than they're receiving in income on their, on their system open market or portfolio. And they're about to raise rates another 75 basis points, so it's going to get worse. So, but that, but that definitely, has, like, the way I look at that, that has to be factored into the interest expense of the U.S. government. We have to consolidate those accounts. Yeah, I mean, the, the Fed remits its, whatever the Fed It makes, remits its gains, yes, but it which, has to also remit losses. It, 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 it doesn't have to remit losses because the Fed can always print money to cover their losses. Um, they don't have to if they don't want to. But you're right, they've probably been remitting, I think, somewhere around 60 to $80 billion back to the Treasury in January every year. That'll go to zero this year or in, 23, uh, in early 23. 
but they don't have to remit a loss back to the, uh, to the uh, Treasury because the Fed doesn't have to abide by mark-to-market accounting. So we could look at it as market people and say they're at a loss, but they don't have to look at it that way. No, I'm actually referring to something different, right? So the, the interest expense on excess reserves that they have to pay into the banking system in order to maintain a corridor system right. Right, is an actual cash outlay that has to come through the Treasury. Well, it comes through the yeah, it comes through the treasury in the form of the interest that they receive on their portfolio. Well, no, because the Fed is also paying to banks, right? The right. Interest. Well, that's where they get the money to pay to the banks. No, I, is they I, own nine trillion dollars of correct. treasuries that bring them into cash flow, and they turn around and remit that out as interest on reserves. But if the interest on the bonds don't rise, and you increase on. $4 trillion, $6 trillion worth of excess reserves, yes. interest rates by 400 basis points, that's $240 billion that I now have to pay out into the banking system while I've not changed my income receipt at all. Right, yeah, that's why I said that they're at a loss now, but they're at, they just hit that loss level now. They're not, you know, the loss at this moment that the Fed, the Fed is paying out more in interest of, on reserves than they're receiving on their portfolio but it's very small, but they're gonna raise rates again, and they're gonna raise rates again. So it's not gonna be quite, I don't think it's quite that much at 240 billion, but it is a big number. Can I interject to clarify something here? Hold, so uh, Mike, what you're talking about, just so I'm clear here, what you're saying is that in the intermediate term, before the government has to refinance some of its longer duration debt, the Fed is stuck in this paradigm where it has to, as, as rates go up, it has to increase the amount of payments that go out to the banking system in order to maintain the corridor system. But that's, that's the opposite of what we're talking about with respect to, like, the government paying more, right? Right, right. Well, I, th- what, that what is your comes point? from the government. Right, I, I understand. I mean, like, uh, institutionally speaking, that the Fed would be... But your point is it just compounds the problem of, like, whether it's Peter or Paul, it's coming. It's, somebody's paying. Right. Somebody's paying. But as long as it's variable, it will come right back down when they cut rates. But the more con- bigger concern is if they roll over in a five-year, 10-year, 30-year debt at higher interest rates and have four or five coupons that they have to pay for a decade or more, then that becomes a longer-term burden on the government. That will take more time. I think one of the things that concerns me most is if I look at this last round of job owning and basically saying, you know, we're really serious, we're going to raise, it actually, unlike prior rounds, has not shown up in lower inflation break-evens. This is actually now pushing inflation break-evens higher, right? And this yeah. is one of the theories that I have around this, which is that by failing to allow the economy to adjust, you and I are actually having this conversation today, by effectively trying to crush demand instead of allowing the economy to retool itself and reposition itself, responding to this and radically changing the structure that basically causes everybody to turn around and say, hey, I'm going to wait and try to figure stuff out. I am not going to build any new houses, despite the fact that there is a generalized and recognized housing shortage. I'm not going to you know, make significant investments in oil and gas because the cost of capital is so high. I'm not going to make significant investments in infrastructure because I'm going to wait for the magical two years from now, the cost of financing are going to go down. Right. Right. By delaying all those things, aren't we actually locking in inflationary conditions? I think we, 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 we definitely could be, but to your first point, when you look at the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, the TIPS market, you know, you call me skeptical about that market. Before the pandemic, the Fed owned 8% of that market. They now own about 27% of that market. They have been the largest buyer of it since the pandemic. In fact, the amount of TIPS securities outstanding has barely increased versus 2020 if you exclude the Fed's purchases. What I'm trying to say is they've, they, you know, they're the butcher that put not only their thumb on the scale, they put their whole hand on the scale and they've kind of screwed that market up. That's the way that I look at it. And so whenever I look at what the real rate is on the tips break evens or what I look at the uh, uh, real rate on tips yields or the tips break evens rates, I then look at historically and find out that the predictive ability of that market is zero. It really, you know, it's an interesting number to look at, but it doesn't mean um, that that's what's going to happen. So I definitely agree with that, that I don't think it's going to happen, right? But it right. is ultimately a market in which you receive rewards for making bets that reward you for being right, right? Right. So it's going to be the closest thing we have. It also, interestingly enough, matches almost all of the surveys that we have in terms of consumer expectations. So let me, let me throw a question at you then. Um, 
in a tip security, you get, you get the inflation rate. It accretes to you. That is roughly 8% right now. And the real yield is about 1.6 on a 10-year. That's a 9.6% yield on something with no credit risk. So why does any other investment exist in the world if I can get 9.6% from the government without any investment risk? Um, you know, that is a distorting market that, you know, I don't have an answer to you. It well, seems so, like so, so the quick <laughs> answer to that is just very quickly, I was actually outside dealing with my kids who are struggling to fill out the paperwork to buy I-bonds on a personal basis where you're limited to $10,000, which, right. of course, I've given to them, right, so that they can lock in the 9% sort of yield, right? They're now talking about expanding that to 30000 But within the scheme of most, you know, financial planning components, that's meaningless, right. right? So it's effectively a protected market. Now, can I go into the market and buy tips? Sure, in terms of the inflation-protected securities, but to your point, that's a relatively illiquid market with no guarantee of my compensation. I'm ultimately subject to the volatility around an inflation print over a short period of time. Sure, inflation could come down. Which then means I need to go out and hedge things like intra I need to hedge out oil as the largest component of that, et cetera. Um, so I, I would suggest that you know the higher the volatility of the underlying components, things like oil, et cetera, the harder that is to lock in a quote unquote arbitrage position. Right. And every quant I've talked to when it comes to the tips market, whenever they model what are the factors that move the tips market, it is usually the VIX, the yield curve, some other measures of volatility, the price of oil or gasoline. And other than the price of oil or gasoline, the rest of those are not inflation measures. Yeah. But then we, you know, so we put a bunch of non-inflation measures in there and then we say that this is the market's compensation for inflation. Um, so other than it being an emotional reaction, the crude oil prices or gasoline prices, kind of the same thing. Um, it really, that's why it has, a, I think, a zero correlation to reality because it, what it moves on is stuff that isn't inflation. Well, I'm not entirely sure I would agree that it has a zero correlation, right? It, it is not a great predictor. Yeah. But that also, in the time period in which we've dealt with tips, yes. we really haven't had significant inflation volatility of any meaningful component. That's true. The first tip came out in the late 90s, so right. we don't have one from the 70s. We don't know what it would have been if they yeah. existed in the 70s. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it, I, I do think that this is one of these interesting things where we can look at that and we can dismiss it. But the obvious bet, if we have strongly deviant views from it, is to actually express them in that market. That can be yeah. done without the hedging components. We just can't lock in non-arbitrage conditions. We can express a bet there. And I do think it's really interesting that nobody really seems to want to go do that. Yeah, I find it very interesting myself, too. I mean, we're just going to have more of it. Cool. In other words, isn't the path here actually, especially if a lot of the, mo a lot of the operative models uh, are kind of broken, which is what I think we're all talking about here, whether it's markets, pricing, the consumer, doesn't that kind of imply that whatever entities in the economy or in the political economy have power are going to be the ones that are actually going to step in and sort of I, what I'm thinking is more government spending, more fiscal programs, energy policies, military spending. Again, we could be on the, wor on the verge of a World War III type of a world. I mean, that's, I mean it, it, the reality is that this is where things are going if something doesn't stop it. It doesn't seem to me that the paradigm right now, and now we're kind of moving into a conversation about war, but the paradigm right now in Eastern Europe, Russia, Ukraine, NATO, as, as events currently uh, are sort of moving is escalatory. Something needs to intervene to change that dynamic. And I don't, and I'm somewhat. I, I would argue <clears throat> what you're describing is what I've called the post-pandemic economy Hopefully, it is post-pandemic, and we're not ongoing pandemic economy at this point. Right, because you're not wearing a mask, and I'm not wearing <laughs> yeah, a mask. Yeah, exactly. So. We don't go back to that. <laughs> but um, in that, um, what the post -pan every pandemic has shown throughout history that it takes a trend, and it speeds it up. And so like when I said earlier that you know we're in a sci-fi movie, and we've jumped ahead to 2045, we're not doing anything we weren't going to do. We're just doing it much faster. And so... I think the thing we have to come to, I believe we have to come to grips with is that the era of worrying and fretting about deflation ended in 2020. I actually think it ended in 2009, but let's just go with 2020. Uh, and now we're into a period of inflation. Now I know when I say inflation, I know you mentioned this in the last panel with Chanos, uh, 
Um, when I say inflation, everybody goes to Zimbabwe or 1980 or the Weimar Republic. And no, it's like a three and a half, four percent inflationary world, not a one to two percent inflationary world. And that means that rates at four percent are neutral and the market's choking on four percent and they've just reached a neutral rate. Now, why do I think that we've got a post pandemic period of more inflation? It's the end of cheap labor. Um, you know, that la uh, labor is having a bigger um, say at the table in terms of negotiations. Look at the rail strike. And I thought it was interesting, uh, Mike Green, you pointed out correctly that the freight strike, um, they, the first thing they agreed on, just like with the West Coast um, uh, Longshoremen, yeah. it's the price increase. That's done. That's done. They're going to get a 24% price increase, uh, wage increase. Over a five-year period. Over a five-year period, 14% immediately, and then the rest comes over the next four years. Uh, but they're arguing over work rules. And that is a tell to me that labor has gotten a bigger say at the table. You know, usually it was you just, here's a bunch of money, now go back to work. And they gave you a bunch of money, and they said, hold on a minute, we want more. But the cheap labor might be coming to an end. And... Evidence of that in the data is wage inflation is running at around 5%. It has been for about almost a year and a half now. If you get a 5% wage increase, and that's the whole economy, it's going to be hard to have a 2% inflation rate with a 5% wage increase. Three real is way too much historically. You know, maybe um, half a percent might make sense, and five might be a bit elevated, and it might come down. Cheap goods, in a just-in-time inventory world, China all of a sudden looks like a really unreliable supplier between the supply, between the supply chain problems, between the political problems that they've got, uh, and with all of the fights we're having with reshoring, friend shoring, the semiconductor fight, they look like they're a, a real a problem. Cheap energy. I'll channel my inner Zoltan Posner here, and he pointed out that $27 billion of cheap gas goes to Europe pre pre-Ukraine war, and that is used to create $2 trillion of cheap goods. Every manufacturing process is, is cheap energy is the driving force. It's not labor. They don't have cheap energy anymore. Witness today, the UK has pointed out that industrial production has fallen 23%. That is a depressionary decline. Why? Because look at the price of gas in, in natural gas in Europe. So if you've got all of that, that is going to push inflation up. Now, you still have a couple of forces that are working to keep it down. One being demographics is still positive for inflation. The other one being technology and making more efficiencies is still positive for inflation. But I don't think those two, I know this is where we disagree, I don't think those two can offset the, the loss of cheap labor, cheap goods, and cheap energy. And that's why I think that we settle out at a much higher inflation rate. And the last thought for you on this. This is the conversation the Fed needs to have. Jay, give a speech. Tell me that you think inflation is persistent at 3%. If you say that, raising rates 75 every meeting to try and get to 4% as fast as you can makes a little bit of sense to me. If you still believe that this is a one-time post-pandemic surge of inflation and it's going to dissipate in 18 to 24 months back to 2%, you're way overdoing it. Give that speech and let us debate it. Now, the problem, I believe, is within the Fed, they can't agree. Jay Powell, maybe Chris Waller, a Fed governor, maybe Jim Bullard, St. Louis Fed, are probably on the idea that this is a persistent inflation problem. Leo Brainerd, the vice chairman, Charlie Evans, the Chicago Fed president, maybe some of the staff at the Fed are not. And since they can't agree, what is every speech we get from the Fed? We're going to raise rates at the next meeting by this much. We're not going to pivot. They can't go beyond 30 to 45 days because that's about the only thing they can agree on at this point. They can't tell us what is the big picture on inflation. And also, as you point out, Mike Green, talking about the big picture also is a bit of a mea culpa, what you did last year as well, too. And they don't want to go there as well. To underscore something Mike just said, if I go back to my theory that you know the end of cheap labor, cheap goods, cheap energy, that's not forever. What that is is a call that the economy needs to be restructured. That means things have to, there is cheap energy out there. It's just mm. no longer coming from a pipeline from Russia. There's other places you can get it. 
What would be nice is to get some financing to change it, but what's the Fed doing? Jacking financing rates every 30 days. So they're, they're working against trying to do that. There is other forms of cheap labor that we could possibly do, maybe even a restructuring of the labor market, but we keep jacking rates. But again, doesn't that necessitate, but doesn't that imply that they're going to reverse and they're going to reverse hard at some point? And we're going to have something like yield curve control. We're going to have permanent um, uh, subsidized government financing. Sure, they're going to levels. reverse and they're going to reverse hard at some point. But at what pain point does that come? Everybody wants to think it comes at a painless pain point. That's the way I perceive the pivot talk, is that they're going to stop some Tuesday and then it's just going to go up and I'm going to well, say this nightmare's over. But it's going to be coming at an extreme pain point. Well, and Jim, how about you? Final, any final well, words? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the big drivers of the last 40 years was globalization. So if I just look at the war in a general sense, it is basically dividing up the world. We're dividing up the largest energy producer, if you add in all energy in this, in, I was going to say the Soviet Union, but let's call it, uh, let's call it the Soviet Union. And uh, that they're, they're going to have to, they're going to, they're going to be at odds with the West and they've got a spigot that they can play with to, you know, um, make the West's life uncomfortable. China might join that axis. Saudi Arabia might join that axis. This doesn't sound like a world of massive deglobalization or globalization anymore. It sounds like a world that we're heading towards in deglobalization. And if we are heading into a world towards deglobalization, it is going to be a big reversal of a lot of the positive tailwinds that we've had over the last 30 or 40 years. Yeah.